Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michelle Dukamis, and I am one of the faculty in the School of Business here at Southern Adventist University. And was asked to do a little video on personal finances in the light of COVID-19. We know that these are interesting times in our country, in our world as a whole, and people are going through different things. I teach personal finance. It's one of the courses that I regularly teach. Yet these situations and these times are a little bit different. So I'm really happy I get to do an interview today with a friend of mine. His name is Mike Mudd, and he works as a senior account rep for a human capital management firm here in Chattanooga. I'm happy to have Mike because he knows more about some of the current things and some of the current governmental factors that go into these times as well. So we're just going to kind of have a conversation together. So Mike, thank you so much for being here uh, with us today. And you know, there are basic things about personal finance that we usually teach about saving money and getting out of debt and all these types of things. But with things kind of different because of COVID-19, um, just want to know about some of the resources that are out there. So why don't we start with just something basic. The government has uh, issued some relief towards COVID-19 in the form of like the FFCRA, the CARES Act. Can you just tell us what those are briefly? Um, yeah, so the FFCRA, the Family First Relief, um, that basically um, provided uh, in its onset, it provided sick leave, extended family leave uh, for people that were directly uh, impacted by the coronavirus. Um, and so a lot of people aren't aware, but um, there's actually six different categories that qualify you for some of these different pays. Uh, the first one, the sick pay, which actually pays 100% of your pay for up to 80 hours uh, for any time beginning April 1st up through the end of the year. Um, and then they extended family medical leave. And then there's also just a generic family leave that was added into that that pays at 67% of wages. And that actually extends out for 10 weeks. Um, so anybody who's impacted and there's several different criteria i'm actually going to send you some resources that you can uh link to uh, when we get done with our discussion but the um the ffcra specifically you know if somebody was impacted by a state or a federal quarantine as a result of covid 19 if they were uh caring for somebody who was directly impacted by the virus or they themselves um you know if they had children that were you know, they had to stay home and care for because they were out of school as a result of mm -hmm. schools being shut down. Um, those are all factors that would qualify them uh, for some of this, uh, essentially what is sick pay or family leave. And it's not, it is paid through the employer. Um, but so like what we do specifically is we would actually set that stuff up for a client. They would pay it and then the government uh, reimburses them for any of those payments. They get a tax credit as well. Mm. Um, you know, some of that stuff also uh, cuts out the portions of tax for Social Security and Medicare for employees and employers if they want to defer those payments mm -hmm. uh, just to kind of relieve some of the, the payroll impact for employers during that time. Um, part of that, um, in order to get some of these things, especially when we get into the CARES Act, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, as long as an employer doesn't lay anybody off, um, you know, all of these things are fully reimbursable um, by the federal government. So wow. um, the FFCRA is something that I think a lot of people are not really aware of, um, you know, especially if, you know, for people that have young children, if they've had to miss work because of childcare, um, then there's at least two weeks that would be paid at 100% of their normal salary wow. um, starting April 1st. And then after that, if, you know, if they continue to have you know, issues that keep them out of work, they would qualify for the family leave um, that would then be, extend that out for 10 weeks, but it's just at 67% okay. of whatever their earnings are. Uh, yeah, now, that's really big because, you know, Mike, I have students that, that have told me specifically that they are caring for their younger siblings right now because their siblings are out of school. You know, their families don't have childcare right now. Um, their parents aren't able to work the same way because they're taking care of young children. And we even have students that have young kids at home. Right. So. Yeah. And so I think that it's a good idea for individuals. I mean, I can tell you that my brother, um, you know, he 
had a similar situation. He's got young kids. He was, you know, had to miss work for a few days. And so I was telling him about these benefits. He was unaware and his employer was actually unaware. So I sent him some resources. They then went in and checked all of it out. And so he was able to get that through them. Um, but you know, they, because they don't have a, a company like ours to kind of help educate them on some of this stuff, they didn't even know that it was available. Wow. Uh, so, so maybe, are you saying that some individuals should maybe approach their employers? Their employers may not know that they have these options. Absolutely. And you can go to the Department of Labor website and I'll, you know, again, I'll provide some of these resources. I've got some flyers that I've put together that you can give out in PDF form that, um, you know, maybe you can post on the school website. Uh, that would point people in the right direction so that they can kind of intelligently present some of this stuff to their employers so that their employer will be aware of the benefits so that then they can follow up and, you know, make that available to their employees. That's great. Um, and so again, that's the FFCRA. Um, and like I said, I'll, I'll provide a, a link and a, and a flyer that's going to provide a little bit more detail as far as the specific qualifications, timelines, and that sort of thing. Um, and then the, the CARES Act, uh, which is the uh, Coronavirus Aid Relief Economic Security Act, um, that <laughs> that act uh, goes a step further and actually deals with um, some things that are going to be more specific to your students. Um, there's actually some of that stuff that it provides emergency relief for institutions of higher learning to provide grants, um, provides some of that you know funding for students themselves. Um, you know, there's actually a website they can go to. It's uh, www.2.edu.gov. I'm sorry, .ed.gov. And um, that's going to break down some of the stuff that's available. I think me and you talked about before that uh, Southern actually has already um, taken advantage of some of that. So I don't know if you want to kind of touch on that real quickly. Yeah, you know what? This is a big area too. If there are any students or families of students who are watching, you may not know this I know some emails have gone out recently, but Southern is getting money from the CARE Act. And there are some ways these funds can be used. So it can be used for, for students who needed food. Maybe they had a meal plan, but then they went home and they need food. Uh, emergency housing, essential academic needs like books, laptops, hotspots. I know I have people that have internet issues, things like that. Healthcare and related to COVID-19 expenses, uh, expenses related to dependent care, child care, expenses when vacating the dorm, students that had to change tickets, baggage fees, all of that, uh, students that's mission, where their mission trips were canceled. I know I was supposed to be on one of those trips. And then just other miscellaneous costs. And these are for students that are enrolled in the winter 2020 semester part-time or full-time and there's an application deadline of May 7. So students or parents of students, if you're out there, please check that out. The website is southern.edu slash COVID-19 emergency fund. Southern.edu slash COVID-19 emergency fund. All right, and then uh, the second part again in the CARES Act. Um, so the CARES Act, offered some additional benefits for people that have been misplaced as a result of COVID-19. One of those is extended um, unemployment benefits. And so, you know, most states, um, you know, filing for unemployment, you're going to get a very small percentage. It varies by state as far as what your typical earnings would be. And so what the Fed did is just stepped in and added an additional $600 per week to whatever you would get from the state. Now, that's not going to go above what you would normally make. But just as an example, if you if you made a thousand dollars, you know, every two weeks and you had unemployment and as a result of unemployment, you were only getting two hundred dollars a week, then that additional amount would be three hundred dollars so that you would get your full thousand in that two weeks. You wouldn't get the full six hundred per week, but it would just it would max you out to what your uh, typical earnings are. I do have a friend of mine that, um, you know, he works for Ford and his, you know, their company has been shut down. And so, you know, that he had to file for unemployment and he's already received his unemployment benefits. And he said that it's, you know, pretty much what he was making before. So, wow. uh, so those benefits are out there. Uh, if you have been misplaced, if you've been laid off or furloughed as a result of the, um, you know, the COVID-19 uh, situation, uh, you would want to, 
get online and go to your local state unemployment website, the, it, the place of your employment is where you file for unemployment. And so there's some people that like, for example, here in Chattanooga, maybe somebody works in Chattanooga, but they live in Georgia or they live in Alabama or, you know, and so because of bordering state scenarios, uh, your unemployment is always filed in the state that you work because your That's employer. Very important. Thank you. Yeah. Your employer pays unemployment insurance for you. And so mm. you have to file in the state where you work. Um, but I mean, most states have shut down uh, any type of call centers um, because they're just overwhelmed. So a lot of people are not able to get in touch with somebody by phone. Um, so the easiest way is just to go online. Uh, file your claim. And I mean, it, when all of this stuff first started, um, you know, a month ago, it was kind of sketchy as far as getting stuff done. A lot of the websites hadn't been updated. And so some of the questions that disqualify you right off the bat that weren't applicable in this particular situation were still there. Um, but most of that stuff has been fixed. I know that states like Florida, Tennessee, Georgia, uh, Kentucky, Indiana, uh, most of most of the states that I deal with, California, Nevada, New Mexico, those states have all updated those. So I, yeah, I'm sure you have students all over the country, but that's going to be something that uh, they'll want to look into just to check. But that um, the CARES Act also provides benefits for um, you know small businesses. So the small business loans that provide payroll protection um, for you know, employees. So if, a, if an employer chooses to stay open and continue to pay their employees, then the government will pay in, in what is essentially a grant. Um, mm -hmm. The government is just providing funds for them to continue to make payroll uh, so that that business can stay open and so that their employees continue to get paid. Uh, and that does extend to um, contractors. So self-contractors, people who would typically not get a W-2, but they would get a 1099. Uh, there are benefits that are available to them as well so that they can continue to maintain whatever business that they operate. And okay, because so that was a question that I've had because, you know, typically you get unemployment if you're an employee, but the self-employed people are kind of just left out to dry. But it sounds like during this, even self-employed people can potentially get some benefits. Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, the with... Uh, with a 1099 contractor, somebody who's self-employed, they pay empl the employee and the employer portion of taxes, and they don't pay into unemployment insurance in most cases because they're self-employed. And so, um, so what the the CARES Act does is it extends benefits for these SBA. It's SBA.gov is the website for people to go to if they're interested in looking at this. Um, but the small business loans, which does extend to uh, contractors as well. Wonderful. Okay, so sba.gov would be where to go if you're a small business, self-employed small business, something like that. Correct. And actually, the I mean, honestly, at this point, um, you know, the, the Federal Reserve's pushed the money out. And so, you know, banks and credit unions have, well, they had, they just did this additional stimulus package. So the original stimulus package, that money basically ran out. I don't know if you've seen some of that stuff, but, it'll, but that people took advantage of that fairly quickly. Some of that money's actually coming back. There were people who should not have received that, that money sure. <laughs> coming back, but, um, but, you know, they extended it an additional $500 billion. So there is, there is more funding out there. Um, and so honestly, the easiest way would just be if, you know, whoever you're, financial institution is, whether it's a bank or a credit union, would be just to reach out to them and explain to them your situation and they'll be able to help you uh, with the application process and, um, you know, get you in the direction that's going to be more suitable for your specific situation. Great, great. Okay, so the banks and credit unions can help. That's really wonderful. And speaking of uh, banks, loans, all that type of stuff, <clears throat> you know, a big issue right now is that some people are having trouble making payments whether that's on a mortgage, rent, student loans, credit card payments even. Mm -hmm. Is there any, I know there is some help with that, but can you explain a little about the help with loan payments? Um, well, so, I mean, most, I have received notifications from most states. Most states are suspending uh, payments for uh, anything that would be federal or state related. So, I mean, and I, you know, the just, because we're discussing it, like garnishments, tax levies, student loan payments, um, things of that nature are essentially being suspended. 
uh, for the time being. So most of our, most of my clients, we're just suspending all of those uh, payments for individuals. So even if they are still getting a paycheck, uh, they're not making those payments. So the same thing with mortgage lenders. So uh, for the most part, your government agencies. Um, so, you know, like if you have a, a HUD loan, if you have something that, like for FHA or, you know, one of the, one of the government agencies that um, would be the one that houses your mortgage, uh, most of those mortgage payments have been suspended. Now that just means that it's essentially put on pause. Um, you know, that it's whatever your payment, if your payment is being deferred, then it's just being tacked on to the end of your loan. And so, um, but you would want to contact your, again, contact your financial institution for specific details with regard to that. Um, you know, again, we have received notification for most states. Um, you know, typically when I receive a notification, it will be for a specific individual, but then it will say to suspend deductions for anybody that is paying to this agency. And okay. so, so most states have already done that. Now, my advice would be to contact that agency directly just to make sure because you don't want to just assume um, and not make a payment. But, um, but for mortgages and student loans specifically, in most states, um, there has been uh, a deferral program that has been put in place to offset some of the issues because of, you know, I mean, we, the first round of stimulus checks went out the $1,200 per uh, person, um, you know, and then the $500 uh, additional per child. Um, I mean, you know, that's going to help some people some, but, you know, the median rent for most people in America is around $1,000. And so, you know, you figure the length of time that this has gone on, that $1,200 is essentially gone if somebody used it to pay rent and utilities and any other expenses that they had. So, um, you know, the you just want to make sure that you're following up with your specific institutions to see what type of programs they're instituting, especially if your mortgage is through a direct lender. Um, you know, I mean, some of them are, are offering no interest and deferments on payments, but it's going to be very institutionally specific. Right. I have heard that there's a difference between a federally backed mortgage and ones from other direct lenders. So I love that advice. Contact the lender directly to make sure. So don't just assume that your payments are deferred, but there are deferments that are out there, which is great with the zero interest and whatnot. Um, I have also heard varying by locality. There are some more uh, basically putting on pause evictions for lack of rent payments. Uh, sometimes credit card companies will work with you. So it's, I always say this, it's, it's always best to contact your lender. Even if this was not COVID-19, like if you ever get in trouble with your debts and can't pay, I always tell my students, contact the lender. Better to do that than to just not pay, mess up your credit, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and just a quick point on the rent deferrals. So, I mean, most of that protection as it relates directly to the CARES Act is for um, people who are getting subsidies. So this would be, you know, people who are receiving like a Section 8 subsidy or, you know, a, a, a homeowner who is receiving a, some other type of subsidy or a renter who is receiving some type of government assistance, you know, whether it be food stamps or something else. And so those protections are, for the most part, they are going to apply to those individuals. Um, so if you're, you know, somebody renting from a private party, um, you know, it's really going to be between you and your landlord. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, most, for the most part, um, the CARES Act does offer a lot of other benefits, um, you know, when you tandem that with the FFCRA to be able to provide some relief in the way of income. And, you know, they're talking about, you know, this next round of stimulus is actually going to be a payroll credit, which, you know, is, is going to be somewhat beneficial, not as much, but I mean, I know that the house is talking about another round of, you know, potentially $2,000 payments, which we'll have to wait and see how that goes. But, um, you know, with, uh, with some of the funding that is now being pushed out, um, I would just be very cautious, um, you know, with how you spend your money with regard to rent and mortgage and things of that nature to make sure that you don't put yourself in a position where, you know, you're not able to survive. In some cases, um, I know just discussing this with other family members that were out of work 
waiting on unemployment and haven't received unemployment and use the stimulus check early to go ahead and cover rent or house payment. And then they were out of money. And so it's, it's good to get ahead of it and talk with your specific lenders first to find out if deferments are possible, uh, especially if you don't have any um, current income. All right. So with that, I know we're about out of time and I thank you for your time. I think all those things are hugely important. Um, you mentioned also stimulus checks. I know some people have already spent them and needed to. Uh, if they haven't spent them, do you have any recommendations of what to do with your stimulus check? I mean, I would honestly, I would hold on to it. Um, you know, um, I personally, you know, I, I did receive a, you know, part of that stimulus and, um, I mean, you know, I just put it in my savings. Um, you know, I've been very blessed. I mean, it's, you know, there's a lot of people that are out of work because of the nature of what I do. It's actually created more work for me. Um, you know, but I think that if, you know, you just have to be smart about your finances and, you know, if you received a stimulus check and you haven't spent it, then you should hold on to it and wait because, I mean, they're starting to try and open things up, but people need to understand that there's going to be a significant delay, um, you know, as far as people being able to go back to work full time and, you know, the economy opening back up. And so, you know, the any money that you can have on hand uh, in in case something else happens. And I mean, you know, we we as Adventists understand the things that are going to happen, you know, as, as time comes to a close and, you know, it's very possible that there could be another crisis right around the corner. And so I think that we just have to be smart about, you know, anything that we, anything that we have available um, right now, I think that it should be really prayerfully <laughs> consider, considered as far as what we're going to do with those funds. I know a lot of people, especially young people that got those payments and went and bought stuff that they did not need. And <laughs> I know. And if they've done it already, if you've done it already, I we understand yeah. uh, there always needs, but, but that is a big thing. This is a time of uncertainty probably a good time to, to save or pay off debt for later. Um, Proverbs 22, seven, we've heard this before, but the borrower is servant to the lender. Just because you borrow it doesn't mean you don't have to pay it back later. And so uh, we should probably use our stimulus checks wisely. And you know, Mike, I, I like what you said also kind of as we, we bring this to a close about the fact that we do know in our Christian faith that the world will not always continue as life as usual. Um, things are not life as usual right now, and they may not be in the future. But I, I love that, that Jesus told his disciples in Luke 21, 28, that even when end events and, and crazy things happen, he told them to look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Absolutely. And that's just been something that I've been thinking about. I know that we want to be wise with our money. We want to know our resources. We've, we've got to get by, but it can get easy to get overwhelmed with all that's going on. Um, and I'm just thankful that we do have a God who also provides for our needs and tells us even when these things happen, that we're not meant, I think, to be just afraid and worried, but to realize that our God is with us and that he's coming soon. Absolutely. Well, you know, Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take thought for the things of itself. You know, sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. Every day is going to have its own problems. Worrying about the problems of tomorrow just makes today's problems that much worse. Um, so we shouldn't be fearful. You know, we when we see these things happening in the world, I mean, you know, if nothing else, it should be a wake up call for us as individuals as to what our own spiritual health is. What is our relationship with Christ? Are we are we walking the path as we should and are we not only preparing ourselves but trying to prepare others for the things that could potentially be coming very soon um you know that i think that this this is just another contraction right you know jesus said that all these things are the beginnings of birth pains and so you know i think this is one of those and um you know i think that the government in this current situation is because it was them that caused everything to shut down you know they demanded that you know everything has to close you know schools have to close businesses have to close you know beaches had to close and so a lot of businesses were directly impacted by that and so the government then provided 
some relief as a result. Um, but there may come a time where that's not the case. And so I think that it's a good case study uh, for us to look at what could potentially come uh, in the future, um, in our lifetimes, and what are we doing to prepare for that spiritually and also just generally, physically, with our own finances and, you know, with our families and, you know, where we live and how we live. And so, um, you know, hopefully this has been uh, some useful information. Again, I'll provide some of those links and resources to you after we get off of here so that you can make those available. Mike, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, to our audience, students, parents, alumni, uh, we care about you, we're thinking of you, we're praying for you. Please uh, reach out if there's anything else we can do. God bless, have a great day.